Hi, thanks, uh, Prof Jing, for, for introducing me. And uh, okay, and also like to thank all of you for uh, making uh, making making uh, your your uh, effort to come into our seminar this morning. And I believe you are very interested in environmental, uh, you know, uh, aspects, and uh, particularly you are interested in the environmental and the health. So we have uh, our two speakers this morning going to share with you their experiences. But before that, you know, as a uh, director of Environment Science and Engineering Program at uh, Department of Civil and Environment Engineering at US. So uh, I'm, I'm Professor Hu, and this is my email address. Okay, I'd like to actually give you some brief introduction. It's only a couple of minutes. And after that, I, I will leave this uh, seminar and go to another uh, session and talking to another group of students. So um, I'd like to brief you what is Imam Engineering in our uh, this uh, program, you know, what uh, we are doing. And, um, you know, and then let's uh, let's see whether you will be, you know, kind of interested. And then uh, you want to actually continue your journey in terms of or in terms of uh, protecting the environment and uh, coming up something, uh, you know, which is very beneficial to the society, to the to the to the human being and then you probably want to actually continue with us and to probably read a degree undergraduate degree and even you know you can actually continue with a master and even phd degree today one of our speakers actually she's our students and the finish uh you know uh, all the way to the phd and then uh, she's going to share with you her her journey of her her study as well as uh, her uh, her working currently in the environmental field so Remember my uh, email address. If you have any questions, send to me because I'm going to leave this uh, seminar very soon after give you this briefing. So, um, okay, I only have this slide, right? I promise you a couple of minutes only. And uh, okay, I would like to tell you okay, something quite unique, uh, the unique feature of our environment engineering program at uh, NUS. Okay, so of course I started with a uh, word university ranking. So it's a QS World University Ranking. Uh, our program ranked very highly in the world. 2021 ranking is 11 in the world. Okay, so you can see actually we are really top in the world uh, and also top in Asia. So our program is doing pretty well and this ranking is kind of uh, recognition of our program's uh, achievement. And uh, in this program, our students okay, have a lot of experiential learning, authentic learning, and active interaction with uh, uh, our uh, academic staff, with our industrial partners, with our uh, alumni. And you know, you have a lot of these kind of experiences. Okay, for example, today's seminar is kind of interaction with our alumni, and um, our student got a lot of outdoor events and uh, indoor activities, okay, working on the environmental related projects. And they really actually act as a consultant, right? When they are in the classroom, but they are act as a consultant and they learn from the consultant how to behave like a consultant, how to work like a consultant, how to work in a team and deliver a certain project. All right. And one, another example, you know, about their active interaction is the, this, uh, uh, we call it final year symposium. So when the student come to their final year, they will work on a research project. And it's a very long period of time. It's about one whole year to work on a particular research project under the supervision of the professors. And, and then they have a lot of things to share, to show. So we have a symposium for them to showcase uh, the advancement in the science, advancement in the technology, you know, advancement in the theory and so on. So we invite industry partners come in, you know, to interact with our student, right? So this is this is about their, their symposium and then they are so uh, excited about it. And every year we do it, of course, you know, uh, during the COVID time, 2020, we don't do. 2021, we don't do. Only these two years, actually, we suspend these kind of activities because of the, you know, the, 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 the pandemic situation. But from 2022, this year, we are aiming to re, you know, reassume these activities, which benefit our students, benefit the industrial partners, you know, uh, you know, very much because a lot of company, they will basically just go to this FIP symposium and look for their candidates. And quite a number of our students secure the job on spot. And this happened in 2019. Okay, so this is a, a, the second feature. Third, 
uh, feature will be that uh, our program do have a lot of award-winning and highly experienced educators. We have, uh, you know, a, a team about 10 professors, you know, uh, they have different uh, expertise in the area of like environmental science, uh, which include chemistry, biology, microbiology, and public health. We also have a uh, uh, Professor, you know, uh, very much, uh, you know, uh, uh, experienced in the water, wastewater, uh, you know, uh, the resource management, alternative energy, climate science, and and so on and so forth. So we have a, a number of the professors, a, a team with a lot of international, regional, and local awards, and they are very experienced educator uh, to actually interact with our student during your full year study journey with us. So one example I'd like to give to you, this is one of our senior professors, okay, uh, Professor Ong, he received his uh, BBM recognition from the, uh, the Singapore president in 2016. All right, we received his uh, this recognition from Dr. Tony Tan then, right? So this is a very, very, uh, you know, high level recognition for, for his contribution to the, to the new water development in Singapore. You people must have heard that new water development, right? And we, uh, the entire society benefit from the new water uh, since 2005. Right, so so that's really a big achievement to the country. That's why we have uh, we have such recognition. And another thing I'd like to mention to you is uh, our graduate undergraduate employment rate in 2020. Okay, we reach 100 percent. Okay, so give you some idea. You know, uh, what what is what does this 100 percent means? So 100 percent means uh, you know the highest level in the College of Design and Engineering. No other program is able to reach 100 percent, but our environment engineering make it. And very few programs actually in entire NUS campus is able to reach 100 percent, but we make it. And 2021, how about the 2021? Maybe you are you are you are wondering. Okay, um, the the official read hasn't come out yet, but internally we did a survey. Our students' uh, undergraduate employment rate reach 100% again. Okay, so, um, but I don't want to put it here because it's our internal survey. We wait for the, the formal uh, survey uh, information released. But I like to actually just share with the participants to let you have some idea. So, our program has secured 100% in the past two years. And another thing I like to highlight to you environmental engineering, okay, uh, you know, it's a professional degree. A okay, professional degree means that you are able to go for professional registration after your graduation, after you practice in a field for a couple of years. So after you got some experiences, okay, you can go for professional registration. So one uh, professional registration you can consider is called chartered engineer. So once you have gotten this title of chartered engineer, then it's going to help you to further advance your career. So that's uh, you know, the, the benefits of, uh, of uh, this approach professional registration and our professional degree do allow you to go for this professional registration. So this is kind of like different compared to some other program, uh, you know, you probably will find out they are not really a professional degree. So with that, I think I'm going to end up here. This is the only slide I have. And remember just now my email address. And then, uh, you know, we actually uh, see whether you have any questions, just feel free to chat with me through the email. And then, uh, you know, we uh, look forward to seeing you at another, you know, event, or maybe you are interested to continue your journey with us to, to do something, you know, in the, in the, in the direction of environment engineering, so that actually you are able to fulfill your dream. Okay, so I end up here and I get back to Professor Jin. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof Hu. Um, so I forgot to introduce myself to you at the beginning. Uh, so I'm Professor Karina Jin, and I'm also with uh, Prof Hu colleagues at the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. And um, today's topic is um, a specialty for me. This is my pet area of interest in um, environmental engineering. And it's a cross between environment and health. Uh, most people you know, think, well, that's kind of odd. Why, why health you know, in an environment? Well, actually we're looking at two aspects of um, health. One is ecosystem health, the health of the ecology, 
health of the you know, biota, the flora and fauna in the ecosystem. Um, but at the same time, you're also very interested, of course, in protecting public health, right, which is our human health. And so these uh, two areas are what our speakers today will talk about. Um, I will introduce them uh, shortly, uh, but um, our plan is for, for them to share with you their experiences and hopefully as you listen through, uh, you'll pick up some of the nuggets that they will offer to you and uh, later there will be a trivia quiz uh, which you can um, participate in and hopefully win some prizes. So uh, let me uh, start with our first speaker. Uh, she is a um, environmental specialist in water quality. Uh, she has a PhD uh, from NUS. She was actually my former student back in 2017. And uh, subsequently, she also completed her master's in sustainable water management in Sweden and also her Bachelor of Naturalist. Oh, sorry, she actually did her um, natural Bachelor of Natural Resource Management at the University of Melbourne in Australia. So now she is working at the Department of Water and Environmental Regulation in Western Australia as a senior environmental officer. And so we're very privileged to have her come all the way from Australia uh, to share with us uh, in Singapore. Um, formerly, she was also an environmental consultant at DHI Water and Environment in Singapore and also worked with our very own NEA, National Environment Agency in Singapore. So um, we're very happy that she could join us this morning and share with us her experiences. So Lei Leng, uh, please go ahead. You can share your screen. Thanks, Prof Jin. So I'm just going to share my screen now. Okay, hope you can see my screen well. Yep, we can. Super. Um, so good morning, everyone. Um, first, I'd like to thank Prof Hu and Prof Karina Jean for the introduction. Um, and also thank you, Prof Karina Jean, for the invitation to be a speaker on this outreach webinar this morning. And of course, to Mess for co coordinating this session. Um, so as introduced by Prof Karina Jean, I'm an NUS Environmental Engineering graduate from the class of 2017. Um, and today I'd like to take the opportunity to share with you my experience working for government agencies, both in Singapore and now in Australia, and also um, working for a private consultancy firm in Singapore. So I thought um, I'll start off sharing this roadmap with you to give you an overview of where I have been studying and working the past few years. So firstly, I did my bachelor's in natural resource management at the University of Melbourne. Um, after I completed my bachelor's from Melbourne, um, I returned to Singapore and I work for the National Environment Agency or NEA as it is commonly referred to um, under the corporate development department before I went on to do my master's in sustainable water management in Sweden. After I was done with my master's degree, I came back to Singapore once again um, and I started working for the Singapore Delft Water Alliance as a research assistant. Um, during my time with the SDWA, I was introduced to Prof. Karina Jean from NUS, whom I subsequently did my PhD study with. Um, after completing my PhD, I got a job with NEA as an environmental, I'm sorry, as the scientific officer in the environmental modeling and monitoring branch. Um, I stayed in this role for approximately one year before I moved on to DHI, which is a consultancy firm. Um, where I was working as an environmental consultant. Uh, more recently, in May 2021, I relocated to Western Australia, and a couple of months back, I started working for the Department of Water and Environmental Regulations as a senior environmental officer. So um, to give you some insight into my life as an environmental engineer graduate, I'll share a bit more details of my PhD research in NUS, uh, my time in NEA, um, my time as a environmental consultant in DHI and um, what I'm currently doing now. So in 2013, I started my PhD journey at NUS after being awarded the SMA3 Graduate Fellowship. Um, under this fellowship, I was um, under the supervision of two professors, my main supervisor being um, from NUS, Prof. Karina Jean, and my co-supervisor from MIT, Prof. Janelle Thompson. Um, so in the tropics, under certain environmental conditions such as high nutrient 
concentrations in the water, abundance of sunlight, um, stagnant water. All these factors could lead to cyanobacteria bloom, which is a blue-green algae, a type of blue-green algae, where the water turns a bright green, um, as shown in the picture on the bottom left here. Um, so one of the reasons why we are concerned with these cyanobacteria blooms is that they could potentially release toxin, which could affect the water quality. So where I come in is my research topic was on cyanophages, which are naturally occurring viruses that infect this um, cyanobacteria and subsequently kill them. As an overview, um, there are many things I did during my four and a half years PhD, um, including carrying out lots of sampling in freshwater reservoirs around Singapore, um, processing and analyzing these samples, these water samples in the lab. Um, I also did metagenomics, which involved extracting the DNA of um, the viruses, uh, virus samples, and then learning how to process this huge sequencing data set using scripts. Um, all in all, I'm very grateful to be able to conduct my research in a world-class university like NUS. NUS, as many of you know, it's a renowned university um, constantly pushing the forefront of engineering. Um, during my research, I had access to state-of-the-art facilities um, and also professors who are highly recognized in their line of work. Um, in addition, during my um, PhD study, I, since it was a joint collaboration with MIT, I got to spend three months um, in Boston at the MIT campus. Um, given that NUS has multiple collaborations with different universities, there's often opportunities for students to do an exchange program overseas. Um, so definitely graduating from NUS with a postgraduate degree in environmental engineering has um, helped me to launch my post, sorry, my professional career, given that NUS is one of the top universities in the world. Um, so when I applied for the role at NEA, the advantage I had was my understanding of the local freshwater environment. I had sampling experience, um, I had water quality analytical skills and water quality knowledge. So um, after I graduated from my PhD, I joined the National Environment Agency as a senior as a scientific officer. Um, I was able to ease into the job relatively quickly, um, given that I had the water quality experience from my PhD work in NUS. Um, additionally, having done my PhD in NUS, um, I, had, I had established um, a network of connections that were great for creating collaborations in my job, uh, which proved to be highly beneficial. My job exposures um, in any was pretty big, ranging from evaluating environmental impact assessments, which are basically assessing the likelihood of, sorry, assessing the likely environmental consequences of a proposed development. Um, I was also involved in reviewing and developing water quality guidelines, such as the one for recreational beaches around Singapore. So some of you may be familiar with the ongoing monitoring of our recreational beaches um, in Singapore by NEA. So NEA collects water samples routinely and, and analyzes these samples for Enterococcus, which is a type of bacteria, um, which is used as a proxy to determine if the water is suitable for primary contact activities such as swimming or secondary contact activities such as kayaking. Um, I also oversaw the water quality monitoring around Singapore and provided technical advice to interagency working group. Um, my experience in NA definitely helped me to land the environmental consultancy job with the HI uh, Water and Environment in Singapore. Uh, my understanding of the government structure, regulations and processes were highly valued when I moved on to um, DHI. Um, when I worked for DHI, I had the opportunities, I had opportunity to work on many different types of projects. Um, one of the main projects I was working on was something called the Environmental Monitoring and Management Plan, or EMMP in short. Um, where we monitored the impacts of dredging and land reclamation. This project was 24 seven, given that the operations are ongoing perpetually. Um, one of the key assessments we conduct is to determine if the dredging or land reclamation activity had any impact on sensitive receptors nearby. So depending on the project site and the project footprint, um, the sensitive receptors that we are trying to protect could include things like corals, 
or international boundary given our close proximity to our neighbours uh, and intake facilities. Um, apart from EMMP, I got to work on many other projects as well, um, such as assessing the environmental impacts of specific construction, such as demolition of a jetty or the construction of a jetty, um, assessing how this construction works affect the marine environment, um, and also risk uh, navigation risk assessment of large vessel. Um, my time as an environmental consultant in DHI was extremely uh, fulfilling given the project experience I had. Um, it, was, it also meant that it was a big juggling game between the demands of the projects. Um, there was never a dull day. Um, I was always kept on my toes, having to solve both minor and major problems basically on a daily basis. Um, my experience in DHI definitely was an advantage when I was applying for my job here in Western Australia. Um, specifically, my project management experience working on the EMMP um, project meant that I was already familiar and trained in assessing the impacts of developments on the marine environment on sensitive receptors such as corals and intake facilities. And that brings us to my current role. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I relocated to Western Australia about eight months ago. Um, and I'm currently um, a senior environmental officer with the Department of Water and Environmental Regulations. Um, this is the third month of the job, third month I'm into this job. And my main role is to provide um, technical advice to the Environmental Protection Authority, the minister, the government, and the stakeholder. Um, on the impacts of projects or proposal on marine environment. So with this role, current role that I'm in, um, it's, it's, I'm on the opposite side of the table. So in DHI, I was part of the team writing up this environmental impact assessment projects uh, while in the Department of Water and Environment, Environmental Regulations now, I'm assessing this report. So it's um, very interesting to be on both sides of the table. Um, I hope what I've shared today has provided you with some insights to the career opportunities as an environmental engineer graduate from NUS. Um, I would say your options are pretty much limitless, both in the government and also in the private sector, local and internationally. Um, I've included here my LinkedIn details. Um, and with that, I thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Leilang. I mean, that's so inspiring. I see all your wonderful photos. I want, If I was young, I would do it again. <laughs> Thanks for the opportunity to do my PhD with you. It was, was a yeah. really, really good experience. Well, I hope that, you know, this um, this presentation has given us, you know, your students out there um, a different perspective of environmental engineering, because many of you probably think that, oh, you know, we, you'd be doing like wastewater treatment or water treatment in, in a wastewater plant. I think the, the kind of experience that uh, Lei Leng has shared is that it can be much, much broader and we can look at environmental impacts assessment, actually going out to protect ecosystems and, and the environment uh, environment health, right? So that's that. remember that's the, the topic of today. So now let me um, open the floor for questions because I'm sure you know that, that you, you must have some uh, questions for, for Lei Leng. Please feel free to unmute yourself or put it in the chat if you have any questions. She has a rich uh, body of experience working in various, uh, you know, companies, government as well as non-government. So, so if there's anyone who, yeah, any questions, please feel free to ask. We can also postpone the questions to the end. So um, if you're still waking up, we can wait a little bit longer. Just reserve your questions, think about your questions, jot them down, and then um, we can uh, have another Q&A session after our next speaker, who is uh, Ms. Lam Yuan Chang. So let me introduce Yuan Chang. Yuan Chang is um, also our graduate, uh, former alumni, I'm uh, sorry, current alumni, former graduate. She did a Bachelor of Engineering and Environmental Engine Engineering here at NUS back in 2020. So she's a very recent graduate, and I'm happy to say that she's actually working for me now as a research engineer um, at the NUS Environmental Research Institute, or what we call NARI. Now, um, Yuan Chang's work is very special because it 
kind of came about uh, because of the COVID situation. And you know, most of you are probably wondering how environmental engineers get involved in this. Um, and that's because we deal with wastewater. And in this case, something special known as wastewater surveillance testing. Um, most of you are probably already familiar with the fact that you know, when, when uh, you worry that you might have COVID, you, you do your PCR swab, right? Or you do your ART test. Well, there's another way that we can monitor how COVID is spreading in the environment. And that's actually through your wastewater, the wastewater that you generate. And uh, Yuan Chang will explain much more about that. Um, but the, the advantage of looking at the wastewater is that it can pick up asymptomatic cases. Remember, when you do the ART test or the PCR swab, that's only when you start manifesting your symptoms, and that might be a bit too late. So um, we started this project way back, I guess, last year in January, um, and we've been helping NEA to monitor. So but I will let Yuan Chang uh, explain this. So Yuan Chang, oh, hang on, have I? Yeah, I've introduced you. Okay, please go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, Prof. Jin, for the introduction, and also uh, Lei Leng for the really inspirational um, uh, um, presentation just now. So I'll share my slides now. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, Good morning, everyone. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank uh, Prof. Jin for the opportunity to speak today, as well as MES for coordinating this session. So uh, I'm Yuan Chang, and uh, today I'll be talking about how engineers in NUS are fighting COVID from the perspective of uh, uh, an, a research engineer uh, with a bachelor's in environmental engineering. So I'll be sharing uh, the journey of my time in EVE uh, which is environmental engineering for short, uh, as well as how I ended up in the front lines uh, with my other teammates since the beginning of the COVID pandemic. And uh, you can see the timeline of my journey at the bottom of the slides. Okay, so um, Singapore actually had a very strong focus on contact tracing in the, in the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, I think this is mainly due to the experience of uh, SARS in the past. So we learned from our experience and therefore contact tracing was a very strong focus. So the limitation of contact tracing is that it's actually not foolproof with many cases of COVID uh, that could not be tracked back to the source. And many people only found out that they contracted the COVID virus uh, when they actually started displaying symptoms. And by then uh, they would have already been infectious for some time. So studies on wastewater-based epidemiology, or WBE, have started to gain traction uh, as many institutions around the world successfully managed to detect the RNA of the SARS-CoV-2 virus in wastewater, fecal, and urine samples, which corresponded to the infected population. And because uh, this is a reliable method of early detection, as you can tell when someone has COVID, even before the symptoms arise, NUS decided to adopt this method as well. And that's how this project started. So uh, NUS named this project WST, or Wastewater Surveillance Testing. Uh, and now I will give an overview of uh, the entire uh, WST project. So as you can see on the left here, uh, these blocks refer to the blocks within a dormitory. And of course, in each dormitory, there are male and female toilets, etc. So let's say if you're a resident of uh, this, these blocks, right, when you flush the toilet, uh, the wastewater goes down into the drainage system. And so uh, these manholes you see here are for each block specifically. So block one, and here's the uh, manhole where the... Um, the, the wastewater actually flows through for this block. So these are called inspection chambers. And then how the sewage system works is that uh, these, um, uh, these pipes will actually flow into a main uh, uh, pipe, which is uh, also known as the final discharge. So this manhole here is for the um, final, uh, is, is where you can actually test samples from the final discharge, okay? So um, these, uh, uh, machine over here is an auto sampler, 
and it will be uh, there will basically be one auto sampler at every manhole here. So both for the uh, uh, inspection chambers as well as the FD. And what we did with this auto sampler, uh, what these auto samplers do is that they are installed here in order to collect the residents discharge over 24 hours. Okay, so uh, after collecting, uh, these samples are actually transported to the BSL2 plus lab. So this is not the actual lab, it's just a photo. But yeah. So um, these samples will then undergo a process. Okay, so uh, in this case, we only test the uh, final discharge samples first. Okay, and uh, this process includes um, uh, oh, sorry. This is the process where the debris is removed, the RNA is extracted, and then analyzed with RT-QPCR to detect the coronavirus. Okay, so uh, you can imagine this this us okay, processing the virus. <clears throat> okay, so let's say there's a positive detection, okay, in the final discharge, then the process will be repeated with uh, the inspection chamber. So one, two, three. Um, and as well as the final discharge again. Uh, so this is uh, in order to um, eliminate human error as well as trace uh, which block the virus originated from. Okay. And if let's say after repeating the process, uh, there is positive detection again, uh, OSHI and NUS top management will be informed and then MOH will follow up. So in the beginning uh, of the COVID pandemic, and especially during the height of it, during the lockdown, right? Um, the follow-up action actually meant finding the positive case as soon as possible, and then quarantine of all the hall residents within that block. So, yeah. But however, now, um, with most people already being vaccinated in Singapore, so this process is less time sensitive and it's more of a way for us to monitor trends to see if clusters are forming. So it's not so much about catching the person because yeah, a lot of people have gotten the virus already. Okay, so um, the, the wastewater surveillance testing project requires the coordination of several teams. So we as <clears throat> research engineers uh, do not collect the samples from the auto samplers ourselves. So instead, we rely on contractors to collect and transport them to the lab daily. Uh, we work 24-7 on a roster basis. So even within the sample processing team, uh, we are rostered into three types of shifts. So the day shift, region shift, and standby shift. So to give you a quick glimpse of my work day, I prepared a day in the life video on a day where I was working on the region shift. So enjoy. <laughs> Okay, so the reagent shift uh, is something like the team that processes the ingredients of a recipe, while the day shift uh, is the one that actually does the actual cooking. So um, before I can explain uh, the work that we do in the day shift in the BSL2 plus lab, I first need to explain what the coronavirus is. So the SARS-CoV-2 or the coronavirus is basically a microscopic package of genetic material with a membrane around it. And um, one strand molecules are RNA. So this uh, blue squiggly line here, you can think of it as RNA. 
uh, gives instructions to the proteins, which the proteins then carry out. So some instructions include uh, infiltrate healthy human cells so the RNA can reprogram them into virus making factories or multiply or etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So in mean terms, uh, the RNA tells um, a bit, basically the RNA is the war leader and then the proteins go and fight. Okay, so um, so step one of uh, our work in the BSL2 class is uh, to kill the virus. Okay, so well, how we do this is through incubation. We heat inactivate the virus uh, by heating the samples in a water bath at 60 degrees Celsius. So what this does is that it, um, like you can see the virus here, it's very um, structured. You apply the heat and then um, the membrane is uh, broken apart. And so the virus kind of dies. Yeah, so why we do this is for safe uh, environment, uh, safe uh, experimental lab conditions. Okay, so step two is centrifuging in order to uh, cause the debris, the, all the floating debris here to settle to the bottom in a pellet. And so this pellet can then be separated and removed. Okay, and then step three refers to uh, centrifugal ultrafiltration. So we use amicon tubes that have a special filter in order to produce high titer viral stocks. So all you need to know is that uh, basically over here we have 15 ml and over here we have 200 microliters. So, but the amount of uh, viruses remains the same because they are kept within this filter. So this just means that the concentration of virus increases. Okay, so now move on to step four, which is RNA extraction. So in this case, we use a Kingfisher system, which is uh, this machine here, to isolate RNA from the proteins, fats, and other substances. Um, so if the virus is present, the virus's RNA will be extracted in this process. And then finally, step five is uh, RTQPCR. And there is no easy way of explaining this, but basically what the machine does is uh, four key steps. So um, if you do not have a bio background, this may be a bit difficult to understand, but I'll try to keep it uh, within these four steps. So firstly, um, the machine converts the RNA of the virus into DNA. And then step two is that the, um, the DNA is amplified, or a lot of copies of this DNA is made in cycles in the machine. OK, um, and then uh, Next, uh, marker labels are attached to the DNA strands in order to release the fluorescent dye. So marker labels are uh, within the reagents uh, that I did earlier. And then the last step is that the computer tracks the amount of fluorescence. So um, the value that will be given at the end of the day is uh, the cycle threshold value. And it looks a bit like this. So um, all you need to know is that if the CT value or cycle threshold value is more than 40 or it's undetermined, it means the result is negative. So that's how we interpret the results. Okay, so uh, the lower the cycle threshold is, uh, that means the higher the concentration of the virus because uh, in fewer cycles, uh, enough, uh, the virus is at enough uh, copies per liter for the, um, sorry, it's, it's basically like, uh, the lower the cycle threshold value, the more copy per liter there is. Uh, yeah, so that's why the higher the concentration. So um, how we interpret the data is by looking at this column. And um, so the positive ones are those below 37. So uh, one, two, and three. So the rest of them are above uh, this number. So they're either equivocal or negative. Okay, so um, now I'd like to backtrack a little in time. So some of you may be thinking about choosing an EVE degree, uh, whether it's suitable for you. So uh, I'll go through some of my experiences and maybe I'll give you guys some inspiration. So for this slide, I'll be explaining my final year project and uh, my traineeship on bacteriophage bacteriophages. So uh, in simple terms, uh, I'm gonna say this is a happy, healthy fish in a fish farm. And then here is a bacterial pathogen that can infect a fish. Okay, so it's present in the water as well. 
And so what do you think a fish farmer will do? Right, obviously they'll put antibiotics in the water, right? So yeah, so the antibiotics will kill the bacteria. And so you think, well, great, so problem solved, right? But no, okay, it's not so easy. Some mutated bacteria will survive due to mutation. And then this mutated bacteria that is resistant to the antibiotics will multiply. And then the antibiotics are no longer effective. So what you need to do then, what would a fish farmer do then, is to use stronger antibiotics in order to have the same effect. However, this is not sustainable. And some pathogens have mutated to become completely resistant to all commonly known antibiotics. And the term for this is antimicrobial resistance. So this is a really big problem, not just in ecology, but also in hospitals. So um, basically we were researching a new way to deal with these bacterial pathogens, which is to use bacterial bacteriophages. Okay, so these bacteriophages are as represented by these green uh, alien looking things with a lot of eggs, are viruses that solely target bacteria and infect them. And it mutates as the bacteria mutates, so it is potentially more sustainable and an alternative to antibiotics. Okay. Yeah, so that was what I was researching during my traineeship. Okay. And now um, I'll just go through some of the challenges that uh, I faced as a, a trainee as well as research engineer in EVE. So um, firstly, I would say that um, you should not assume that your experiments will go as planned for the first few tries because there are many issues that will definitely happen when you are doing experiments. So you have to do a lot of trial and error. There'll be sometimes that your bacteria or viruses just don't grow. There might be human errors, there might be contamination, etc. So you need to redo it a lot of times uh, for your experiments. And also there are some risks to your own health, such as lab hazards. So uh, especially working in a BSL, uh, two, two or more environment, you might, there are cases where people get infected by the uh, bacteria or pathogens that they are cultivating or like they prick themselves with a, a needle and then they end up with uh, yeah viruses like they end up being infected and things like that yeah and also for uh, this case for um, the this job in uh, WST specifically we have uh, abnormal working hours so uh, we need to work on weekends, public holidays, and sometimes the standby shifts can be until 2 a.m. But uh, in return, we get weekdays off. So it's uh, on a roster basis. So um, sometimes there are cases of contamination where we need to close down the lab and clean it. So that uh, can take time away from testing and you know doing your experiments. Uh, another challenge is sometimes you get a data that is not very accurate due to factors that we cannot control. Um, sometimes uh, it can also like they're not very important um, challenges, but are still challenges is that well, wastewater doesn't smell good. Uh. Yeah. And also uh, having to wear the uh, protective equipment can be very annoying. It's very hard to breathe through the N95 mask, especially if you're wearing for hours. And also uh, you can sweat a lot. Uh. Yeah. So what are the pros then? Uh, if you're working in uh, as an environmental engineer, it can be very fulfilling because you do really make an impact on society, whether it's the health of people or the environment, and you're getting paid while you're doing that, uh, as well as you can have flexible working hours, which is a pro or con depending on what you value. But um, for, uh, for, for jobs which are non-rostered, but uh, research jobs, right, it can be a big Pro for those who are good at time management. Yeah. Uh, and also there is less staring at the computer because you are working in the lab. And um, this uh, usually research jobs are very technical skills focused. So you don't need to be a people pleaser. So if you're an introvert, uh, this might be a good job for you. Okay, so uh, now I'll move on to uh, what you can learn if you take a bachelor's in environmental engineering. So this is from uh, my experience uh, during my time in uh, EVE. So firstly, you'll learn things like air pollution, monitoring and control. 
So you learn to make sense of haze as well as the dangers to your health. You learn about water quality, money, uh, sorry, water quality monitoring and control, the water chemistry and microbiology to evaluate the quality of water. You learn about the circular economy and resource management. So from an individual perspective, you have heard of reduce, reuse, recycle, but for businesses and whole economies, you have this, which is more complicated. So uh, you also learn about water reclamation and reuse, such as uh, new water, turning wastewater into drinkable water. And you also learn about renewable energy and sustainable development, but uh, you don't really learn how to con uh, construct a solar panel uh, or anything like that. So your design project will be on designing a wastewater treatment plant. And uh, I would say that um, EV is a good choice if you have an interest in solving environmental issues and you enjoy uh, at least one science, so chemistry, physics, or biology, and uh, you don't hate calculations. So you take a deep, time, a deep dive into these topics and the exams will include both uh, conceptual understanding as well as calculations. So actually, I didn't learn about uh, the theory of bacteriophages or how uh, RT-QPCR works in the course but um, I learned it during uh, my time in the project itself. Yeah, so it will be good to keep an open mind. <clears throat> yeah. And uh, so what can you do with um, your experience in EVE uh, with a bachelor's? So you can work as an engineer for PUB, NEA or SEMCOM, for example. Uh, you can work as a consultant for companies to help them make sure that they comply with the local laws, uh, like uh, what Lilings uh, experiences earlier. She um, went through quite a few uh, consultancies. And you can also be a researcher like me. You can do lab work and uh, experiments to get data and use it to uh, analyze trends. <clears throat> okay, so um, if you're interested in Making a difference when it comes to environmental or health issues, uh, you might want to consider a degree in environmental engineering. And I hope this talk helped you gain some insight and thank you for your time. Thank you so much, uh, Yan Cheng. Um, so I really hope that uh, our, you know, the students out there, please uh, feel free to ask questions, tap on the, ex the great experience. Uh, that our speakers have, uh, they can share with you, you know, the, the nitty gritties and, and the intricacies of, of their studies and as well as their working life now. Um, so please, uh, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question or drop it in the chat. I actually have uh, one question uh, that's directed to uh, Dr. Lo. Um, how did, uh, Dr. Lowe developed an interest for environmental engineering. What inspired her? Oh, Lele. that's a big question. <laughs> um, I think it was more of a process. Um, one thing led to another. What I would say it's, um, I think it firstly stemmed from the professors. Um, I was largely motivated by the professors that taught me through, the, through my bachelor's, my master's, and also um, in NUS, Prof. Karina Jean, Prof. Janelle Thompson. I think a lot of professors in the field of environmental engineering have such strong passion for what they are doing um, that it really rubs off on you. And I think after you have um, graduated with those skills, when you go into the working industry and seeing that um, whatever decision or in your, in your daily job, whatever decision you make, assessment on the environment, using the knowledge that you have um, actually makes a difference in the environment. Uh, for example, in my current role, um, my recommendations or assessment of what impacts um, a proposed development has on the environment uh, will be taken into consideration by the Environmental Protection Authority. Um, so all in all, I think my motivation, as, as cheesy as it sounds, is knowing that my work makes a difference to the environment. You can actually, it's tangible, you actually see that you are making a difference. Um, yeah, so I think it's a stepwise process of the people you meet and the direct experience that you gain throughout your career. I hope that answers your question. Thanks, Leiling. Uh, there's another question here from uh, Sadana Ramesh. 
she would like to ask if careers in this course only involve environmental monitoring in the water sector. Um, no, no. In fact, actually, um, environmental monitoring also covers uh, air uh, pollution, um, the air environment, right? So, for example, how do we deal with haze, as well as even the soil environment. So we do look at um, landfills, groundwater, soil um, health, and uh, uh, basically terrestrial, aquatic, as well as atmospheric systems. Uh, and, the, and you will cover all these areas in the module. And, uh, you know, hopefully that will give you the basis, the basic foundation to then um, go off and, you know, explore and understand the environmental impacts in these different areas, as well as also develop the solutions, which is the engineering controls uh, to um, reduce the pollution. So the second part of your question is, what other, what other sectors of the environment would this course allow us to work in? So um, Leilang and Leilang has shared that you, know, you can work in um, government agencies that deal with protecting the environment, as well as consulting companies that uh, also deal with um, protecting the environment. And Yuan Chang showed that you can go into research uh, and, and probe deeper into some of the problems and to solve the problems that way. Uh, I would say that basically for environmental engineering, you can go into both public and private sectors, right? So in Singapore, um, you know, you have uh, government agencies like PUB, NEA, and Yuan Chang also mentioned uh, some of the companies like Semcorp, Kep Keppel Corp, but there are also these multinationals that uh, multinational companies that um, deal with uh, broader infrastructure projects. And usually these broad infrastructure projects, for example, even building uh, like wastewater treatment plants or um, let me see, even, even uh, land, not land, um, uh, highways, mm -hmm. airports. Nowadays, environmental issues are such, such an important part of the development that they will also rope in environmental engineers to look into sustainability issues, life cycle issues, uh, circular economy, um, environmental impacts. So um, whereas before maybe environmental engineering used to be centered more on water, wastewater, and maybe air pollution, solid waste control, solid waste management, now it's actually being uh, broader um, with climate change and uh, you know, environmental impacts pervading all sorts of businesses. I think many companies are, are now engaging uh, environmental scientists and engineers to look at you know, how can they improve their business uh, in terms of the circular economy? How do they try to reduce their carbon footprint? How do they introduce sustainability? And the good thing about environmental engineers is that we have the technical deep knowledge, the know-how, and that's what we hope to impart to you during the module or during the courses. Um, uh, as opposed to maybe um, looking more at the policy side. So we actually give you the scientific basis, the engineering perspective, as well as the science to try and resolve some of these very pressing problems that are being brought about uh, through uh, environmental degradation, from, through climate change, et cetera. Um, maybe now I pass on to Lei Leng and Yuan Cheng. Maybe they would like to also add their perspectives on, on this very, these very important questions that you've asked. Yeah, maybe I'll just say a few words. Um, yeah, I, I think like what Prof. Karina Jean mentioned, um, NUS would equip you with the theory, um, experimental experience, etc. Um, but it's also um, the critical thinking that um, what I what I went through in NUS, I think that really helped to develop my critical thinking skills. Um, very often the Examinations are not just what you find in the textbook. It's not something that you can just memorize and regurgitate during your exams. Uh, what the professors try to encourage is this critical thinking mindset on encouraging you to ask questions, um, not, just, not just follow the books. So I think that was a very important skill that I took away from NUS. Um, and it's not something that a lot of university um, do I think, um, but yeah, that's something that I definitely took away from NUS, the critical thinking um, skills. Yeah. Thank you. 
Yuan Cheng, do you have anything to add? Mm, I feel that what uh, Lei Lang said is uh, very, very true, which is that, um, uh, and yes, uh, especially the engineering modules really equip us with problem solving skills, critical thinking skills in order to solve problems. And in fact, uh, this is not limited to just uh, environmental monitoring. It can be applied to almost any aspect that you want to try. So even businesses, uh, business or banking, you know, many of them uh, employ in, uh, engineers because of our critical thinking skills, our ability to solve problems. So uh, as what Prof said also, uh, it's not just the water sector that uh, environmental monitoring uh, can be used in. It's also um, all aspects of circular economy, the uh, ways to solve issues in um, all different kinds of aspects like air pollution, um, solid waste management as well. Yeah. Thank you, Yan Cheng. Um, at this point, let me introduce you to our uh, Professor Olivier Lefebvre. Where, where is he? I think he's, yes. Hi, Olivia. Hello. Yes, he's my, he's another uh, colleague from uh, our Department of Civil Environmental Engineering, uh, young, dashing, handsome <laughs> professor. <laughs> um, so can I uh, also, uh, oh yeah, there's a question directed to all of us. So I'll ask Olivia uh, also to join in. Um, what is the major difference? Oh, hang on. This is a question directed to uh, Dr. Lowe. What is the major difference between working in the private sector and the government sector? Yeah, that, that is a very interesting question. Um, um, I think in both sectors, there's definitely pros and cons. Um, it really depends on your personality as well, I would think. Um, so for me, when I worked in government agencies, I, I think it's a kind of known thing that government agencies are highly regulated by processes. Um, there is always stepwise approvals, um, things might move a little bit slower, but that is that is how it should be because as a government agency, you are accountable to citizens. Um, so that's, that's one thing that I noted between government agencies and private. The second thing is working for a government agency, you often have um, the exposure to making a making a difference or having your voice heard in policy developments. Um, so that is something very interesting as well. Um, my experience in the private firm has been very fulfilling. Um, if you are somebody who is up for a big challenge, um, if you're good at time management, able to work under time pressure, then I would say that um, private industries are the way for you to go. Um, in the private industry, you also have a lot more, a larger um, exposure to different projects compared to government agency. Um, yeah, so I think those were the two key differences. Um, definitely pros and cons in both. I wouldn't be able to pick one from the other, I think. Um, and also, there's difference between working for a local government versus, um, like for me, working in Australia now, the culture is just very different. Um, so I guess um, the good thing about having this degree is that you are in the position to choose. You can you can go both ways. Uh, you can go private, you can go public. Um, either directions, there is something for you. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Lei Ling. Do we have one more question, a final question, um, also for you. Uh, what do you feel are the advantages, disadvantages of pursuing a PhD after entering the work workforce for a few years as compared to immediately after obtaining your bachelor's or master's? Right. Um, let's see. So I think um, there is pros and cons, of course, if you continue your, your um, PhD journey directly after you finish your bachelor's. Um, I probably wouldn't be able to give much insight into that because that wasn't the route that I took. Um, I took it stepwise, bachelor's, master's, and then PhD. Um, and I think uh, when I took it stepwise, I had a better idea of what I wanted to do. Um, I had more skills, uh, skill sets developed, uh, more experience since I was working for uh, as a research assistant before that and had, had um, a bit more training during my master's. Um, so I think either either route you wouldn't you wouldn't be wrong either going directly from a bachelor's to a PhD or um, bachelor's P master's and a PhD because ultimately when you are doing a PhD it's 
it's a very, very unique experience. Um, and you get a lot of support. I think that is one thing that I would say you, you get a lot of support from your lab mates and your professors. Um, at the same time, it's very, um, doing a PhD, you have to be highly self-motivated. You have to have high discipline as well. So um, yeah, either way, it would definitely work out. Ultimately, it's all about, um, yeah, just, just going with the flow um, and speaking up, asking for help when you need to, yeah. Thanks. Great insights. <laughs> Very helpful. So now I think um, we have come to the end of our, uh, our presentations.
Okay, so so again, I uh, want to thank the speakers very much for their really wonderful and inspiring talks. And I, I hope that, you know, after this session, uh, you will all be able to take away uh, something um, from uh, about what environmental engineering is all about. And if you do have questions, any further questions, please feel free to uh, drop us an email, uh, let us know. Um, Prof Who's contact also if you have specific questions on the program that we offer. We'll be very, very happy to see you. Come and join us at NUS. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. And have a wonderful weekend. You too, Karina. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lei Leng and uh, Yuan Chang. Thank you. Really Thanks great talks. And you now I'm so glad uh, there were some very good questions for you, yeah. <laughs> Lei Leng, specifically with your experience. <laughs> Actually, your experience is really um, everywhere. Uh, yeah, no, but it's great. I mean, it's, it's great for, for new students, you know, be, yeah, because yeah, very few, few of us have that, uh, you know, huge coverage of private sector, public sector, and research. Right. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. you could do this again. <laughs> I think I think for a lot of a lot of the students, it's also like what are the career prospects that, yes. that really attracts them. I think I think that was what I was thinking about as well when I was always like, you know, which course should I do? What what's the next thing? You always first thing is like, can I get a job after that? And it's, definitely, um, yeah. Yeah, and, and it's it's really I think with environmental engineering, it's such an upcoming thing, or it's already up there that it's it's just so versatile. You can do pretty much everything. Well, I'm glad you guys did it. Yeah. <laughs>